Okay. Uh, I think it's good evening. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Sizwe. I talk as an ordinary citizen, a boy from a village, a headman. Uh, um, it's just an input. I won't pose any question. Uh, the main thing that we have to look at is communication. In every development that is taking place, communicate effectively and efficiently. In that way, people will be informed. You cannot do a development or any investment, investment opportunity without involving those people. It's like doing something for me without involving me. Then it's a planning for success. It's a good recipe for failure. So that's the main problem we're having as South Africans. If you can change our approach, the people from the bottom must be the ones, because they are the ones who are living in those conditions. They know their situations. They have their solutions to their problems. But if they, the, the, the way we work, it's other way around. It's top down which is not working for us. And another thing, it's good to introduce uh, for industrial whatever uh, <laughs> to rural areas but, or townships, but the main issue is security. You put solar panels in Soweto overnight, you put them now, overnight they are gone. That investment is lost, it's wasted money. So as much as we want to, to develop, but let's also secure those resources. Because when they are lost, you, you cannot recover that money. You must take somewhere to, 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 to put back that whatever is lost there. So those are the two contributions I'm making. But I, I so wish even a child from where I come from will understand what is happening in this evolution of technology. Because they don't know. You talk about fiber, you talk about four industries, robotics, coding, uh, digitization, they don't know these things. It's only people in urban areas or peri-urban or townships who have access to this information. Just information. I'm not talking about having those resources available in that area. But information, we still far behind. So let's try and work with our people so that people can be part of the future we want to see. Thank you. Thank you for the presentations. Uh, my name is John Tremble. I'm also a professor at TUT with my colleague here. Um, first, more of a comment and a question. Uh, on, I, I've always advocated that the fourth industrial revolution is going to increase productivity, and with that, it's actually going to reduce the amount of human labor ne necessary with the only possibility, and that is if you increase the market share. Now the problem is that most of the developed world is, has, has eaten up the market share and they in fact are declining in population. So generating the market share is one thing, but I'm more on the, on the ilk of Jack Ma, he was indicating that you're going to have a reduction in jobs and the solution is to move to a, to a three day week and a four hour work day. <laughs> so my question is, is in, in, the, in the climate because you, with increased productivity, you are increasing profits. Are you willing to reduce the work load that workers have to, to take on in order to maintain the workforce if you don't increase the, the, the market share? Uh, my second is more of a question to all of you in terms of, of the fact that Africa is the richest continent in the world. And South Africa has immense amount of resources, but we aren't getting the beneficiation. Uh, so we're exporting a lot of things in the raw form. So how do you see engaging the fourth industrial revolution to, to get more of the global value chain? Yeah, of course, um, that was the first thoughts we had as well, is that uh, four hour will reduce your labor. But I can give you an idea of if you think that you can't grow a company. One of our product ranges uh, that we manufacture for predominantly southern part of Africa, we've got 84% of the market share. But uh, we realized that if you 
now just start stagnating with uh, with happiness with an 84 percent market share you will have to uh, lose something so we uh, contrary to what most people do uh, we opened up a factory in china we import nothing from china we produce just for china we opened an operation in Chile and we can't import from there either because they are fully occupied and they're producing for Brazil, for, for Peru and for Argentina. Then we uh, moved to Australia and although our market share is very small there, it's already uh, just over 40 million Australian dollar business just in Australia with the same product. And I think we are not a quarter through the market, markets in the, in the world yet. Because our thinking must not be South Africa only. Because if we can become world class in our production through 4IR and push the efficiency up, then we can capture other markets as well. And that's what we should do. I think we also just need to remember that Africa is still growing incredibly fast. There is huge opportunity in Africa for economic growth, and there is still the demographic growth, the people growth. And with the Africa Free Trade Agreement, the opportunities for market size, we always talk about South Africa as being a small market, but actually we're not just South Africa anymore. We're part of Africa, we're part of a market that's already over a billion people, which is effectively the same size as China or India, and it's a growing, economically growing market. So the opportunities, I think, are just enormous. But as Rick says, we have to just identify them and find them. Uh, the communication... Sizwe. Uh, Thank you, Sizwe. Uh, I'm also from the rural areas. <laughs> And I'm not saying that in a joking way, but in a serious way. I think right there is a business opportunity. There's clearly a business opportunity, but uh, communication is not effective, even though the Fourth Industrial Revolution Commission is under the Department of Communication. <laughs> <laughs> There's an opportunity right there, you know. I don't know that there are no entrepreneurs in this room. There's definitely an opportunity. Somebody just needs to go and talk to someone somewhere along the way, you know, and convince them that there is a case of making sure that effective communication goes to rural areas and they can deliver that service. So that, that's the way that I'm saying the challenge uh, that uh, has been mentioned by, by CISWIN. But I definitely agree with you that most of the times communication doesn't happen effectively. Uh, half the time the people are lost between information information doesn't arrive, especially to, you know, the most marginalized people. With respect to what uh, my colleague is, was talking about in terms of uh, efficiency and the suggestions that we may need to go to a three-day week, we are busy with an incubator, as was mentioned earlier on. And what we're saying to our incubators is that You've got this rail manufacturer who is a local company, but they are not the end. They are the means to the end. Because they've got a relationship with the French, when you do what you do, when you develop your services, when you develop your products, don't think them, because they are the easy market. But think beyond them. Think the global opportunities that come with supplying service to them. So that when the French engineers come there and they see the quality of work and services that are being provided by your enterprise, they think about the problems in India, at Alstom, and the problems in uh, Brazil, at their factory there, the problems maybe even in Europe, their factory there, is what has been mentioned. That when we become effective and efficient, I think we need to understand that then we can play globally. And that's where the real opportunities are. If you go to Germany, uh, we were at the German Chamber, I think, uh, a week, last week. There's a region in Germany. They say that uh, their GDP for the region is 100 billion euro. For the region, not the country. 
the, the region, right? like how then, oh, I mean, let's say Limpopo. Limpopo, <laughs> you know, the GDP for Limpopo is 100 billion euro. Are they eating up all those things themselves? Absolutely not. And, and, and I think there's an evil of just being self-focused, that we need to solve our own problems here, develop things to solve our own problems. It's a good thing to solve our problems. But actually, you solve your problems even better by solving other people's problems and making sure you are generating from wherever to solve your local problems. So, 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 I, I think even the policy makers, if they are here, the way that we think about these things sometimes, we are like, let's fix our problems. Then when we fix our problems, then we we'll go to the rest of the world. But maybe let's fix the world problems, get resources from the world, and fix our problems even better. Yeah. Because sometimes I think we got the equation. I don't think that equation uh, we, we've got it right because we say well, let's use manufacturing and solve our local problems, mm. and then we forget that actually if we solve those people's problems, we'll get money to solve our problems even in a better way. It's education. We are speaking NHI right now. You know, if we had a lot of uh, money being generated from taking things overseas they wouldn't have problems with financing NHI. But it's because we are lo looking internally only, and we're forgetting that the big economies of the world, they don't consume that bigness. It's consumed by the rest of us. So by looking outwardly, you're actually solving your internal problems. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> yes, you can applaud, please. <laughs> it's a lady who wants to ask a question. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Chayaza. I'm a nuclear engineer. Um, I just wanted to ask Prof. Um, a question because when he started, uh, he spoke about um, education. So I wanted to ask what kind of measurable strategies can be put in place to ensure that we are not just um, solving the issues or, or we're not teaching learners to solve the issues of now, but we can also take into account the issues of the future because it seems like we're using a reaction strategy, like a problem has to come before we start thinking about solving the problem. Eva, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, one definite thing is that we don't no, need nuclear in terms of energy. <laughs> 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 that was just a commercial. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 I mean, from, from what we are doing, uh, I mean, we are in manufacturing. One of the conversations that is taking place is that young people don't think that working in a manufacturing factory is sexy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> huh? are, are the young people here? It's, 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 it, I mean, factory. So, 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 and, 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 and in our thinking now, we are talking about how do we create urban factories? Factories that can run here in Hatfield, and no one knows that there's a factory running in Hatfield. And, and, and with these uh, fourth industrial revolution technologies that are available, the possibilities are there. So, 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 I think the unfortunate thing is that in our education system, somebody mentioned it earlier on, I think it was you, when you spoke about um, how long it takes to get a qualification approved. It's unimaginable, you know? Uh, Prof. Trimble always says to us in our department that I don't understand why the system works this way. Because you must develop it for half a decade, and then uh, you must go and knock at uh, CHE for another three years before everything is finalized, and then you start offering. So, 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 if there's somebody from the Department of Higher Education, I think that conversation was done there. H how do we change that in this day and age that we have got this? eight-year period of getting a qualification ready to be offered as an accredited qualification. And what is even worse now is that the Department of Education and Training also says that we cannot offer credit-bearing short-learning programs, the ones that you can develop quickly and start offering. You can't offer those and they, they be credit, but you can just offer them and there's no credits to them. So, so, so I, I think somewhere along the way, it's good that uh, the Department of Science and 
higher education have been put together, you know. Hopefully they can have start having those conversations that with where we're going, the way that we're thinking about preparing curricula to prepare people for the future of work needs to change. The last thing that I want to mention is last this year, actually in March, I went to the Hanover Fair. I don't know how many people know about the Hanover Fair. Anyone? Yeah. Okay, it's only a few. So the Hanover Fair is the world's biggest technology fair. That's where all your new technologies are normally introduced then. All the big companies from around the world go there and they exhibit their technologies there. And what was interesting for me, being an educator, is that guess who Angela Merkel has made space for at the technology fair? Pardon? Educators. Not educators, students. Why is the, our SRC is here busy with uh, toy toying and the struggle and, you know, burning the buildings? The German student is engaging global players about ideas that they have about technology. How do you think that transforms the learning of that student? The mindset of that student when they go into the class and... It's, it's a totally different view and, and when they are there, they are not only there to exhibit technologies that they have that are the patents to the university, they are there to exhibit technologies that are owned by their businesses. Just think of yourself as a student in that setting. How you... Just your, 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 your paradigm of thinking about learning is transformed. So, so, so I think uh, I'm seeing here there's some effort that uh, some of our students are presenting the things that they are doing to us here locally. But I hear next year there's a science forum. Uh, the minister, if I heard him right, he said that the global science forum is coming to the country next year. 2021. 2021. Okay. In two years' time. So we've got enough, year, enough time in two years' time that we prepare the same thing, you know, have a place where it's just for the students. And the good business is there. And STF maybe can also be involved in that effort. And, and, and we have this space, because if you go and tell the students who are doing, whether it's these new qualifications that have been promoted, uh, that this is coming up in 2021, and we'd like you guys to come there and display technologies that you've developed. Then already our students, the way they think is going to be different. They're not just going to think production technologies that are in the factories now. They will be asking themselves what is required for the future. When you go to when you get to 2021, what are the things that we need to be thinking about? And if we put those challenges in our universities, in our departments, in our campuses, and that's what the, 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 the learning and the teaching is focused on, then we'll definitely be able to prepare for the future. Thank you. Can I um, this is um basically the end of our session, so please have a, a last say. Thank you. What Prof is also talking about, and we haven't actually spoken about it, is the soft skills or power skills or whatever we're going to call these things. Things like teamwork, things like collaboration, things like critical thinking. Those things need to come into our curriculums from basic education all the way through and include, be included in adult education as well because if you have a critical thinking mindset or you have an analytical mindset, you can start thinking differently. You can see the world differently. I, mean, we, I was at a TBIT, uh, I was at a motor industry conference talking about skills, and they talk about the same curriculum and the same equipment that they were trained, the people were trained on in the 70s. And we're still training people with that same equipment. And yet, our motor industry BMW factory in Roslyn is, I think, the most productive in the world for, what do we drive? Left hand drive, right, right hand drive cars. Whatever it is that we drive, the most productive in the world, despite their training system. But it's what has BMW put around that existing system to make that happen. I want to end with something, um, someone told me this quote the other day, that Michael, they follow Michael Jordan on Twitter, so not Michael Jordan, the basketball guy, the R&B guy. We found an F&B, R&B. And he's obviously made a lot of money in his life. And one of his things on Twitter the other day was, I don't want, I'm tired of getting ideas. I want people who can do their ideas. And if we can make that happen, if young people, says we wherever you are, if you can make that stuff happen, then we have a fundamentally different country.
I quickly want to end the following on from Cherry. I think there's a responsibility both from the educator as well as the student, and that is from the first year of study. Instead of going to lie on the beach in December, go and work. Uh, we offer that opportunity for a lot of students, but then you know you work in the factory. <laughs> and, you, and, you, and you prepare and you prepare samples for the for, for testing and you uh, and you uh, if you're in IT you you lay the cables and you fix the overhead projectors and that's the way I think and but unfortunately industry just can't pull because we don't know what the students are and where they are in the education process the educator must also push to say these are students that are willing to do this in December or June or whenever, can you take them? So, a last word. I think from our side, we also have a gaming approach around the fourth industrial revolution. Because all of us, when we were growing up, we used to play mommy and daddy. That's how we learned how to moms and dads, those who are. <laughs> From playing, you know, so we've got a game that we are, we, we're rolling out to industry, to the universities. We're even taking it to high schools to help students think about the careers of the future as they play the game. So that, that, that's definitely something that I, we are saying is our little contribution to this conversation around the fourth industrial revolution. Hopefully, we can play with Parliament one day. Yes. <laughs> to our speakers, thank you very much, all three of you. It's been incredibly rich and thought-provoking, and in this short session, I think there's enough to think about for the whole of the holidays and possibly <laughs> next year. <laughs> Why the, lying on the beach? <laughs> Why lying on the beach? <laughs> um, Sherry's uh, presentation will be on the website, nsdf.org.za. Okay? It's org, organization. And, and there will also be the, the video record of, um, of what happened here today, photographs, possibly audio where the cameras didn't reach. Um, so please have a look on the website, nsdf.org.za. And thank you very much for our audience, um, your rapt attention and your participation. <laughs>